Today, we're talking about strength and liberty, two seemingly disparate topics at first glance that actually have a lot of interesting connections upon closer examination. What is liberty? The word comes from old French and Latin words that refer to freedom and absence of restraint. So how does this relate to training? There are two clear ways. Increasing strength increases your physical liberty. As we explain in detail at the Starting Strength Seminar, strength is an extremely important physical attribute that has the most positive trickle-down effects on almost all other physical traits. Increasing your strength through training leads to fewer restraints on your ability to do what you want to do. We see this most profoundly when we work with our older masters athletes and help them regain or maintain their ability to live and function independently, or with our middle-aged folk whose back pain is gone after a few sessions. But it equally applies to everyone who can now do things they previously weren't capable of because of their newfound strength. The process of increasing strength increases mental liberty too. At Barbell Logic, we talk a lot about voluntary hardship. While there are many ways to go about this, strength training is a salutary one that also has obvious physical benefits. But the mental barrier is broken when new, heavier-than-ever-before weights are lifted successfully again and again, despite the fear of failure, is a big deal. It opens doors for lots of people who have never done anything physically difficult or haven't in a long time to take on new challenges in life with confidence and gusto, whether those challenges be physical, emotional, or mental. But there's lots of other connections between strength training and liberty too. Liberty implies freedom from restraint, not freedom to be given things that other people worked for. There's a lot of discussion today about rights. The rights implied by liberty are those which we can all share simultaneously without infringing on anyone else's rights. When it comes to lifting, you can take the driver's seat and profoundly improve the way you perform, look, and feel without making anyone else one iota poorer, weaker, or worse off. But nobody owes those things to you, and no one can give them to you. Unlike the political process, where people can vote to appropriate other people's money for their own ends, strength and fitness remain among the very few things that you cannot buy, outsource, or even steal. You have to work for every bit of them yourself. Another idea is self-ownership. The ideas of classical liberalism helped Western civilization flourish by seeing the individual as inherently important with inalienable rights instead of as a cog in someone else's machine. Slavery, one of humanity's longest standing shameful practices, is today widely recognized as a terrible human rights violation in large part because it denies people self-ownership over their own bodies. Likewise, strength training is a very profound way to take active ownership over your own body to do something with it that renders it more capable, more durable, and more resilient. To change it in a way that is uniquely yours, because the changes in appearance and improvements in performance that result are based on the work you put in and your own genetic code, not some label or limitation that an outsider placed on you. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, at Starting Strength, we often get asked some seemingly simple questions. At what weight should I move on from the novice linear progression? Or, I got up to 315 on my squat. Am I ready for intermediate programming yet? The answer to this question is a profoundly insightful connection between strength and liberty. There is no predetermined weight at which your LP should end or at which you should switch to more complex programming. You should train properly, appropriately for your level of training advancement and move on only when you can no longer make progress at the appropriate rate. I have personally seen this be as low as 185 pounds and as high as 500 pounds. Every case is so individual and unique that there is absolutely no way, indeed no point, in trying to predict beforehand what that weight will be. In other words, you are an individual first, and your strength potential and linear progression outcome cannot be predetermined based on your group identity. I mentioned earlier the concept of inalienable individual rights as enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. That no one should have the right to take away your life or liberty without your consent, barring you infringing on someone else's inalienable rights. The implied ethos here is that you are an important individual first, before you are a member of any kind of larger group based on age or sex or race. You are not merely a lemming, a part of the Borg Collective, 
who is only identified by your group characteristics and automatically follows the averages based on those characteristics. It's wrong to prejudge people based on group averages or characteristics, just as it's wrong to prejudge where your own numbers should be when you finish your linear progression, switch to intermediate programming, or consider yourself advanced. And we have numerous examples of why this is so important in training. We found that a lot of men who take up training below the age of 40 finish their linear progression squatting somewhere between 250 and 300 pounds for three sets of five. But it's so important to realize that this doesn't mean that you will finish your linear progression at 275 pounds or anywhere even close. And we see this mistake over and over again. Imagine if our lifter Rich, who recently took his LP up to 500 pounds with SSOC, had stopped at 275 because it felt like it was getting hard and well, that's about where the average is. So he just assumed that's where he should stop and change his programming to a weekly or bi-weekly progression. It would have taken him over a year to achieve what he accomplished in only a few more months with a program that was tailored to him as an individual instead of automatically assuming an average. Lifting often gets hard in that 275 pound range and you might think, well, well this is about where it should end anyway and you don't push through. Well, you're new to lifting. You've been at it for six or eight weeks and you don't yet know what hard really feels like. You might very well have the potential to get to 365, 400, or even more. But because you limit and define yourself based on group average instead of your own individual potential, you lose the chance to add more pounds to your squat quickly. And on the flip side, our friend who did a perfectly proper LP and finished at 185. If he'd have been comparing himself to the group average, he'd assume he did numerous things wrong not related to programming and would simply have tried to go through the LP over and over again, making little progress and not understanding why. Thankfully, I was coaching him. I knew he did it right, so moved him to more appropriate programming and today he squats well into the 300s and he appreciates the increased liberty in his life that training has given him. We can have one lifter properly finish his LP at 185 and the other make it to 500. They are both individuals with different potentials and capabilities, even though they're part of the same demographic group. There is so much within group difference in all kinds of traits and characteristics that assuming each person in that group is simply an average representative is a fool's errand. Despite these seemingly self-evident truths, we've seen a proliferation of identity politics peddlers who seek to divide and judge people by their group identity instead of as individuals. As strength coaches, we see examples every day of the futility of prejudging people based solely on their membership in a group demographic and not on their individual characteristics, traits, and responses to training. We can speak in generalities about groups and averages, but when interacting with an actual lifter, we need to pay attention to the individual in front of us and not just assume the person has all the average traits we'd expect to see in a member of her demographic. And this is an important lesson that carries over into life too. We have traits, talents, characteristics, life experiences, and desires that make us unique. Our ideas and arguments should be judged on their merits, not based on the demographic group we happen to belong to, just as the weights on the bar at which we'll finish our linear progression and move on to intermediate programming are based on our unique traits, not a predetermined average based on the group we happen to belong to. <sighs> Whether as coaches or as humans, we need to remember to see the unique individual in front of us. We'd love to hear your thoughts on strength and liberty in the comments below. And if you know someone that this video would resonate with, send it to them so they too can start to explore the relationship between strength and liberty. And to learn more about the value of strength and voluntary hardship, click the link here.